Hey, everybody. This is Wake Up Call, the podcast. I'm your host, Christina Previtt. And joining me today for another edition of the Hashtag Fem Squire series is Melanie Legron, the founder of Legron Law, Atlanta men's law firm, practicing immigration and criminal law. Welcome, Melanie. Thanks, Christina. Glad to uh, be on. <laughs> Thank you for saying yes. I'm excited to interview you because you've had uh, a prior career law. Well, I guess I was going to say law wasn't your sole gig, but it sort of was because you were a police officer before. I so, was. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's really interesting and I can't wait to talk about that. So you've been on and kind of both sides of the fence, so to speak, doing criminal law, but also having been a police officer. So I usually like to start off with where did you go to college and what did you think you wanted to be when you grow up? But I kind of want to hear when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? You know what? Nothing related to law. <laughs> Nothing related to being a police officer. Actually, a flight attendant. A I, flight attendant? How did that happen? I just wanted to be able to travel all over. And I was like, okay, it seems like a gravy job. I want to be a flight attendant. And but then I don't know where it went after that. <laughs> I get that. I get the travel. I think that's something all of us have in common, all the fem squires. So then I guess we should start then. What, where did you go to college and what did you think you were going to be when you grew up then? So I am originally from Grand Rapids, Michigan. So that's where I grew up. Um, and then I received a actually a full scholarship to Michigan State. But I wanted to get out of the city. I wanted to experience something bigger. Um, and I had family in Detroit. So I ended up applying to University of Detroit. And that's where I went to college. It's now called University of Detroit Mercy, but I don't claim that. I say it's University of Detroit. <laughs> what were you thinking you were going to do? So originally, I had started off in accounting. I don't even know why, but I started off in accounting. Absolutely hated it because I hate numbers. Um, I hate math. <laughs> Never was good at it. And so then I just kind of had to think of, all right, well, what would I possibly even like to do? So I started taking criminal justice classes and changed my major. Um, and then it ended up being criminal justice. And that's what I graduated with a bachelor's in. Were, were you focused on, well, what am I going to do where I can actually get a good job and be self-supporting? Is that yeah. what it was? And it was. And because at the end of the day, I'm thinking, OK, well, when I graduate, what is a degree that is going to land me a, a good job? You know, I can make decent money and, you know, be able to pay back all of these student loans. Somehow accounting popped in my head and that's what I started off with. But clearly after my first year, I said it's not for me. Well, good for you for not following something that wasn't going to be your jam. Why did you go into criminal justice? You know what? Honestly, at the time, I thought, oh, this is going to be an easy degree. You know, it's like you're, you're 18, 19 years old. You really don't know, you know, really, I didn't have, really have much guidance only because, you know, I'm that type of person where, you know, I listen to mom and dad, but really didn't listen to mom and dad. So it was like, I just want to do my own thing. So I was like, oh, criminal justice will probably be easy. And then I started taking classes and I really enjoyed the legal aspect of it. I was just started diving into the law and things like that. And I was like, okay, this is really cool. I think this is something that really resonates with me and it clicked. And so I, I stuck with it. So you could have been thinking at that point, if you like law, police work, or you could have thought about law school at that time. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up deciding on police work? Initially, I never wanted to go to the police department. My interest once I got into criminal justice was the federal government. So still a government job, something that's going to, you know, be able to, you know, help me pay back my loans, be able to, you know, have a good living, government benefits and all of that. So I wanted to go to the, the U.S. Marshals. And then at the time when I graduated, they weren't hiring. So that's how I ended up on the police department, because for me, going straight from college, I guess, to law school wasn't in my mind. It, it was too, that was too far away. I came from Grand Rapids. So I have to say it was more of a smaller town vibe 
to come to a big city from high school to college is already a transition. And then even thinking about going from college for me to law school, I was like, yeah, no, if that happens one day, okay, great, maybe. Um, but I, I want this, this police job, this government job. Let me just do that, have a career, you know, there and I'll be fine. So I really, I was one of those kids that kind of didn't know what they wanted to do. I just had to feel it out as I went. It was more or less, what am I going to do for now? That's pretty you know, the ballsy. That were really cool. I, mean, I don't know. Is the, the police officers were really cool. They really were just good guys. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to put my foot in it and just do it. Were there a lot of women? Did you know women officers at the time? I met them just in the academy. So yeah. you knew that you were going into really a male-dominated profession. I mean, it's pretty ballsy. I'm not sure that you realize how ballsy it was. Now, when people tell me, yes. But, you know, I was always a tomboy. So it was like, for me, I felt like, yeah, you know, whatever. I can, you know, I climb trees with boys so I can go, you know, play cops and robbers with them, you know. Well, not to mention that it's sort of dangerous too, right? I mean, you have to, you know, you're kind of a target when you're wearing a police uniform and you're carrying a gun that you may actually have to use and be in situations that are dangerous. Did, did, did you think about that or were you like, nah, I'm good. I can handle it. No, it was really, ah, I'm good. I can handle it. Let's do this. So how was boot camp or police academy? It was stressful. It was strenuous, but it was still, it was good. I mean, it was okay. I guess because I'm that type of person where if I, if I, set my mind out to do something, then we're just going to figure it out and I'm going to do it. So I get into the police academy and, you know, we have to carry these, you know, hundred and something pound dummies and we have to climb the wall. We have to do all of that. And I'm like, well, I'm athletic. I can do it. You know, I said, it's more of a mind game. Police, the police academy is more of a, a mind game. But I think I might be projecting a little bit on you because I was never athletic and I don't know, I, I think to me, the idea of going into the police academy, especially back then when I was so young, I would have just been scared shitless. I don't know. Well, you didn't have that problem, it sounds like. And then how long did you do that? Almost 10 years. Is that long enough to get something out of the pension system? No. <laughs> oh, darn. Oh, well. I stopped right before that. But, and that was the reason, because... At the end of the day, I'm not one of those um, political people. I, I, I can't play politics. Um, so I didn't want to be a sergeant, lieutenant and move up in the ranks. But I didn't want to stay on the street either. You know what I'm saying? The whole time. So that's when I started figuring out, okay, what else do I want to do moving forward? And at the time, I actually, I was, I was married. So I, I married a police officer. Now it's like, okay, well, you know, where are we going to go from here? Did you meet him on the job? I did. What was it like to be a police officer, especially as a female? I think it, it helped me. I grew up really fast, I guess I could say. You know, I saw things that I thought maybe that I would never see in life. You know, to this day, I, I remember my first like homicide scene. It, it's just ingrained in my head and I'll never forget it. Like all the details. And it's so crazy because I look back at my life and I start thinking of other things. And I'm like, I can't remember this or I can't remember that. But I can remember that specific incident. So it, it just, it, it's ingrained in my head now. But it was interesting. Um, it was challenging. Um, it was rewarding. It was a really good profession. I mean, it, it really was. At the end of the day, being a police officer back then, totally different, of course, than now in different environment, different like vibes. So back then when you were a police officer, most of the officers that came on the job, you know, that was their passion. That was what they wanted to do from when they were a child, you know? So they really took it to heart. And, you know, we didn't have what we're having now as much because I think now on the police department, you know, it's, it's a job. People are just getting a job because there's nothing else to do. Whereas back then it was a career and everyone took pride in it. And you could see that. So, you know, I backed up my fellow officers, you know, males, as well as, you know, they backed me up. They treated me, you know, for the most part, obviously with respect, 
I am a woman, so you do get the little differences here and there. But for the most part, you know, anybody that, you know, that anyone talks to on the police department that was my partner, we all had each other back. So can you share with us what that experience was on the first homicide scene? Because you said it, it's deeply ingrained in your, in your head and obviously had a profound impact on you. Can you talk about it? Um, sure. So I was, um, with my partner that night and we were in a location down in what we call Southwest Detroit. And that is where there's more um, gang activity. There's a lot of, um, it's, it's, you know, it's culturally diverse um, and a lot of gangs. So we were on a special detail down in Southwest Detroit. The call came over the radio. And so for me, and I have to back up, I guess, the story to let you know, I didn't work um, uniform. I was in plain clothes. So we were in the semi-marked vehicles, the burgundy semi-marked vehicles in plain clothes, you know, with just our badges around our necks and our, you know, vests and things like that. Um, so I wasn't a uniform officer. So we hear the run come over the radio and, you know, our first uh, reaction is, okay, we're going to let a uniform officer take the run, obviously, because we'll just back them up if they need any, any help. And the run came out as a shooting. Um, it was actually a shooting in progress. And then as we got closer to the location, it came, there was multiple calls. And basically then it was a man shot. So because we were in an area that we didn't really know, you know, like the back of our hand, and we were trying to avoid the scene, we drove right into it, like down the street. And we see people and they're waving and they're like, hey, <laughs> and um, a big crowd out there. And so we pull up because obviously now we're here, we're in it. We pull up and there's a, a heavy set gentleman. He's, he's on the ground. He's face down. And you could see in the, um, in the pavement, you could see bullet. Like you could see where the pavement is, you know, like where bullets had hit the pavement because he was shot with an AK. Um, mm -hmm. So a very high powered, uh, yeah. <laughs> machine. So right. like an, an automatic rifle? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, what they, what you always see on TV, the AK-47. So those ones that keep continuously firing. So you can see where the bullets had hit the, the pavement. And then of course he was there. You could see in his back, you know, where he was shot. And then all you get, all I could hear in the audience was, you know, mom screaming at the top of her lungs, my baby, my baby, my baby. And um, it's like a movie scene. It was, it was, it was so surreal. <laughs> so then, you know, long story short, the ambulance comes and they have to turn him, they have to pick him up, obviously, and turn him over to put him on a stretcher in the ambulance. And that's all she wrote, because you can just imagine what, you know, <laughs> the scene was when they turned him over. So yeah. how did that affect you at the time? Did you just kind of go? Was it just like business as usual or yeah. were you just like, wow, were you taken aback at the time? It was like business as usual. And so I really thought something was wrong with me because I'm like, why is this not like affecting me to where, why am I not, you know, crying like that lady or, you know, it was just business as usual, you know, okay, we need to get control of this scene. And, um, and then I remember we got a call over the radio and they said that they were like, the shooter is actually in the crowd. So somebody had called in to say that the shooter was in the crowd. So now it just totally changes our whole mindset to where, okay, now we have to be on alert because the actual person that did this with an AK-47 is in the crowd. So where the heck was the AK-47? I don't know. <laughs> Cause it wasn't on him. <laughs> and we, and actually, and, and he ended up leaving. So we did not end up arresting him. So how long had you been on the job at that point? Oh Lord. <laughs> I don't even know if it was a few months. Oh, so you were really a newbie. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, wow. So did that color, do you feel like that colored your experience moving forward? Um, yeah, I think it, it just kind of made me really numb to things. Really? Um, yeah, just mm. really like, you know, whatever. Yeah. Were you mindful of that or not when you no, were there? I wasn't at the time. Um, mm. And this is something that you realize later in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. I want to hear more about how you realize that because you you still go through your ten years. Mm-hmm. When did you really start thinking like I don't think this is my forever job? After because I got so I got married, um, and then I'm thinking, okay, are we going to do the family thing? you know, had babies and so on and so forth. So that's when I kind of started thinking like, okay, you know, this isn't going to be my forever job. This was his, his career, but not mine. And, you know, let me see what I can do moving on. So I actually, I went back to school and I got my master's. I, I went to um, Central Michigan University and I got my master's in public administration, which there it was like business. Um, because then I'm thinking, okay, so what on top of this can I do to then find another, you know, decent job to just kind of, you know, make sure that I have a steady income. Because I, you know, back then, our parents kind of ingrained in us where, you know, you, you get a job, you stay there for, you know, 30 years, you retire, you get a pension, and you move on. And if you have to have two and three jobs, because that one's not supplying all of your needs, then you do that. Yeah. Um, so that's just kind of where my mind was like, okay, what's the next step to make sure that I have a, a, a decent job. So I got my master's in business or public administration, worked odd, just odd jobs here and there, because I, I quit the police department, worked odd jobs here and there. And then <laughs> this is the, the story that everybody is like, what? So my husband at the time, I, I had expressed to him that I wanted to go to law school. And I remember him telling me, well, it's really expensive. And so, you know, I was like, okay, you know, I understand that's fine. And then I got a divorce in 2006. I started law school in 2007. Hmm, doesn't seem like that's just a coincidence. <laughs> Do you think that that was part of the breakdown in your relationship? And, you know, you go into as much detail as you want about that, but do you feel like that was part of it? No, actually, no, because it wasn't, it wasn't like, um, I wasn't telling him it, telling him like, this is my passion and I want to do this kind of thing. It was just a, a casual conversation. Situations happen. We got a divorce. And so of course in my head, it's like, all right, well, this is my opportunity. Let just go do what you want to do because you know, you don't have to answer to anybody but yourself. So. Yeah, that's a good feeling. And I have to say, uh, I can relate to that mentality of, you know, you get a job that you, you said about your parents that you get a job and it's about security and and income and being stable and having that financial security. But a lot of us did not grow up and I feel like this is more prevalent now, but we didn't grow up with someone saying, well, what's your passion? What makes you happy? You know, it didn't seem like there was much talk at all about that. Right. Right. And what's going to pay the bills? Yeah. So do you feel like at some point did things shift for you where you did start to be more concerned about, well, what is my passion? What do I really want to do? I, I did, but I always struggled with that because I always struggled with, do people really have a passion and a purpose? Like, is it something really that we, that's innate in us, or is it just something that they find throughout their way um, of life? And so that was me. Cause I'm like, well, I don't really know if this is my passion or purpose for right now, you know, I'm going to do a really good job because that's me. And that's, if I put my mind to it, I'm going to make sure that I succeed at it. But is this my passion and my purpose? I didn't know at the time. Well, you've worked with David Nagel, right? So, I mean, I've worked with David too. So anybody who has heard David for even five minutes knows that there is, there's a lot of emphasis on finding your purpose and, and living the life that you really desire and, and tapping into that. I know that you must have spent a lot of time thinking about that, like what your purpose is and what 
your real passion is? Well, now, because I only connected with um, David Nago within the last year. Oh, well, you are in for a ride. (laughs) Well, a year is still, you know, you can have a lot of growth in in a year. I mean, I've Mm -hmm. worked with him. Well, I I went to my first event in 2007, 2017. And, you know, in that time, I've learned and grown so much and it's exciting. Yeah. So tell me what your experience has been in the past year. I mean, how do you feel like your thinking has changed or evolved? So now I do feel like, okay, this is what I, the the transition that I had from police officer to lawyer, the way everything happened is where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to do. I get excited about, I love, I love law. I, I get excited about everything, you know, legal. Obviously, as we know, the whole you know business owner thing is is another story. But but I still love the policing part of my background too because I can use all of that for you know to help my clients as well as I'm looking to when I move on from you know being in the courtroom and law to actually doing something to where I'm going back into the police departments and maybe some sort of training or some sort of you know helping them kind of like transition with the times um, because now I have the lawyer background to tell them, Hey, this is how you present yourself in court. And this is what I say. And this is what you do and things like that, as well as having, you know, the police background. So I do feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. That is another thing also where I, uh, I kind of transitioned into representing men and our black males and our brown males because of what I've seen through my career and what I'm seeing in the criminal justice system and with the disparities and things like that. So that all came from somewhere and it just, it transitioned up the line. So for me, I feel like I wasn't supposed to do that, be that straight, that straight shot from college to law school to here. I was supposed to do that roundabout to get me here. Yeah, I think um when you look back on your life and after you've done some of the work, like the, the David Nagel glow, mm-hmm. I call it, or the David Nagel influence, where you do start to look back on your life and piece things together. I think there's a really good Steve Jobs quote where he says something like, you can you can't connect the dots moving forward. You can only connect the dots when you look back and, and mm-hmm. kind of see like, oh, well, that's why that happened. That's how that serves me now. And it sounds like you're exactly having that experience with your police work and, you know, where you it's led you. And you said something really interesting that I want to go back to is you've sort of seen how a lot has changed in the criminal justice system. You know, what was your experience with the things that we hear about now, like police, police brutality, racial profiling? What was your experience with those issues when you were on the job? So it was a thing. It, it, you know, of course, there was racial profiling. As far as the police brutality, so back then it was a little different. So we stop a, a young kid or something like that, you know, doing something that he's not supposed to do. You know, he might get you know, we call it, you know, jacked up a little bit. We might be like, okay, look, stop it, you know, and take him home to mom. Okay. And mom is thanking us for not taking him to jail. You know, yeah, we, you know, we, we, we did whatever we had to do to get him there, but mom is like, oh, okay, great. You know, you didn't take him to jail. You just kind of, you know, set him straight a little bit and they're happy. So, and don't forget too, Everything that happens now always, yeah, it happened back then too, but mindsets were different. Police, you know, they thought about things differently. Citizens thought about things differently. So they weren't so quick to file a police, file a a complaint against a police officer and call and things like that. Because, you know, sometimes they say, okay, well, you know, my, my husband, son, brother, whatever he deserved, whatever he got, you know, it wasn't, you know, like it is now, but 
he's so he's okay and he's not maybe not in jail because we didn't take him to jail and so at the end of the day all good whereas now every little thing people call you know make a complaint about if you spoke to somebody in the wrong way you know what i'm saying they're calling making a complaint on you you know if you looked at them the wrong way they're calling and making a complaint so there's more of that um animosity i guess between police and citizens Also, too, back then you had more of the community policing. So police officers were in the midst of their neighborhoods. Like they were walking the beat. They knew all of the the homeowners. They knew all of the families. They knew that Johnny was, you know, Mary's child and things like that. And so you had a more of a connection between the police and the citizens in the community. Whereas now they've, they've taken that away. So... It's almost like you have that, you know, nobody cares now mm-hmm. anymore. Citizens don't care. Police don't care. And so it's just now you get what you get that you see in the news. Also, too, cell phones more prevalent now. Video yeah. is more prevalent now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that, too. Yeah. It definitely has changed a lot. Do you think it's changed for the better or for or for the worse. I mean, we're, we're seeing more because it's just more visible, Mm -hmm. but the fact that it's becoming more visible also means that we can focus attention on it and try to change the system and make it better. Do you agree with that? Or do you see it differently? I believe there's ways to make it better, but it's going to take a lot of going back to the way things were back in the day. Because as of right now, you can't change the mindset of the citizens towards the police and and vice versa. And so everybody now is on edge. You know, everybody is now, you know, scared of the police when they were supposed to be their rescuers and their, you know, I'm saying the people that protect them. But the police now, too, are scared of citizens because they don't have any respect for them anymore. And so they do say, you know, and, and act out however they want because of everything that's going on. So at the end of the day, I believe it could get, it can get better, but it's going to take an adjustment in, like I said, training and adding more, maybe even like sensitivity, you know, diversity, you know, like things like that into the police departments to make it better. You're still involved, but you're sort of on a different side of the table, I guess, because you're practicing criminal law. Do you have a different perspective of the work that you did from your experience as a criminal attorney? I don't think I have a different perspective. I think I know why, you know, we did what we did. And I like to be able to use that for my clients, you know, defense, because, Mm -hmm. you know, not saying that necessarily we did anything wrong, but we always learned in, in, uh, as being a police officer, the power of the pen. So whatever you're writing down, that's what basically sticks. And so I'm able to cut holes and, and, you know, and pick out holes in a police officer's story because I know why they said what they said or why they did what they did at the time. So I don't think I have a different perspective per se, you know, and there's just good and bad people in, in all industries. And yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it must give you an edge though, that you have this police background when you're representing your criminal clients. Oh yeah. And I'm sure you can use that with your marketing and your advertising because that sh- I mean, if I was jammed up and I needed a criminal attorney, I would definitely consider it an asset that my attorney really understands what's, you know, what happens sort of off the radar and how police officers think and really how the whole system works. Absolutely. It's, it's great to have that knowledge. (laughs) Yeah. Do you ever miss being a police officer? I do. People ask me that all the time. Back then, I miss back then. Um, I, I always say I would never do it today. So if I was that young person coming out and wanted to to get on the police department, no, not today. But back then, yes, it was just a whole different 
I don't know, the camaraderie. It was just a whole different vibe. Yeah. So you get out of law school. Did you know that you wanted to be a criminal attorney? I mean, it kind of seems like a no brainer, but did you mm-hmm. No. What did you want to do? So once again, just kind of falling into line. While I was in law school, I clerked at um, or like interned at a large uh, medical malpractice firm in Detroit. One of my um, law school professors worked there. And so she got me an internship there. You know, in the back of my head, I'm like, yeah, I don't think I want to do the whole billable hours and I don't want to be here and this and the other. But what do we say about safety and security? I got hired after law school because they knew me. I worked there. And so that's what I did for um, a few months, actually. Um, I was doing medical malpractice defense and I... I enjoyed it. Um, of course, I didn't enjoy, like I said, doing the whole billable hours, but, you know, torts was kind of like a favorite of mine. So my favorite class. And so I, I enjoyed it. And then life happens. So I got married again. He was actually a doctor. And so me doing medical malpractice defense work and I married this doctor and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, this seems cool. Let's, you know, continue on with that. But at the end of the day, it wasn't something that I really was, you know, that enthused about it. And then, you know, some other things happened and I ended up wanting to go out on my own. And so when I went solo, I uh, started a criminal defense firm because that is what I knew. From yeah, my that makes sense. Yeah. Did, did, were you excited about doing that? Or was it just another situation where you're like, well, it's what I know. It's a job. I need money. So I'm just going to do that. So I actually was excited. Um, I had really good girlfriends who were attorneys and they were criminal defense attorneys. And so, um, yeah, I was really excited about it because I knew it. You know what I'm saying? Like we kind of, what we know, we kind of get happy about. And it's like, oh, I know this. Like I can yeah. do this. And so I stayed, um, I had my own solo practice in Michigan for about a year, a little bit more than a year before I ended up moving to Georgia. And how did you end up going to Georgia? (laughs) I ended up moving to Georgia because I got a divorce for the second time. And all of my family had migrated to Georgia throughout the years. So literally, I had almost nobody left in Michigan. Um, And so family, you know, you kind of, you know, when times get tough and, and things happen in life, you kind of, you know, you want your family around. And so I moved to Georgia and I think that was like 2013. Well, you got better, better weather, absolutely warmer weather. I guess if you like the snow and the cold, then Michigan is for you. I miss the snow. I don't miss the cold, but I do miss, you know, I miss the snow and, you know, don't tell me the seasons. That's what everyone always says. I'm like, I'm fine. (laughs) I'm fine with one season summer. (laughs) All right. So another thing that I'm really impressed with is that you started to practice really quickly out of law school within a year, right? Within a year. Yeah. So that's also very ballsy, Mel. I'm not sure if you realize that, but it is. Christina, that seems to be my life. Okay. For so long. You're a ballsy gal. That's why you're on this show. (laughs) So, but you know what? I have to say you were a grown up. I mean, you were a real grown up by the time you even went to law school. I I went to law school a, a couple of years after graduating from college, but I felt like I was still just a dopey kid. You know, I had I had worked a little, but only 2 years. And a lot of the students, most of the students are day students that really just went straight from college to law school. So they didn't even really have like a real job, which I'm saying a finger quotes, but you were grown up by then, right? I mean, you had been married, you had been a police officer for 10 years. I mean, I would imagine you need to be a grown up if you're going to be on the streets of Detroit being a police officer. So maybe for you, it wasn't such a great leap to start a firm right away. Were you scared at all? No. <laughs> she it's didn't a, even have to think about it. This is one of those things. And 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 going back to what you were saying about, you know, going to law school and being a grown up and things like that. 
I, yeah, I didn't even, I didn't do the traditional day law school. So I worked Monday through Friday, 40 hours a week. I traveled an hour on the weekends. I went to law school on Saturday and Sunday and then traveled back home to go back to work on Mondays. And I did that for, that was like my first, like almost two years, year and a half. Yeah. And then, um, transition to a different location, same school, because I went to Thomas and Cooley Law School. And that's why I went there, because they didn't have that traditional, you had to be a full-time student. You know, I always say they get a bad rep, you know, because they're not a top tier school. But at the end of the day, I passed the bar on the first, you know, shot. So, you know, <laughs> with working well, 30 hours a week. So, you know what, I, I hear this saying, and it applies to lawyers too, but what do they call the, the guy or girl that graduated last in their med school class? Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? I think at the end of the day, it doesn't much matter where you went or even, you know, how, where you were in the lineup when you graduated, it's going to be what you do with it when you get out. Absolutely. So you started uh, your firm and then I always ask people this question because this was something that I sort of learned the hard way too, is that when you start your own firm, you realize at some point, I'm not just a lawyer now, I'm running a business. Because some people don't realize that. So I didn't realize that until now, till I got to Atlanta. Because there, no, I'm like, okay, I'm just a hustling, bustling lawyer. You know, I'm getting clients and I'm going to court. You know, that's it. It was just me. So I considered myself, I was just a lawyer. That's it. You know, a lawyer that had a solo practice. So I had, you know, I was Melanie Legrone Esquire. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's it. I, so I didn't realize the whole business part of it until Georgia, until when I'm, you know, in it and I'm like, okay, you know, I can't do all of this by myself, <laughs> you know, what am I supposed to do? Oh, I'm supposed to know numbers. No, I don't understand that. I just want to go to court. So yeah, all of that didn't click until, until here. And so you had already started your firm in Michigan. So, but I guess you, it wasn't, it wasn't up and running that long before you moved. So it was just easy to leave. Yeah. Once again, thinking in my head, I'm in a new city now. I'm in a new state. I don't know people. So do I really want to open up a firm and not know how to get clients and things like that? Um, and then that's when I flipped sides and went to the prosecutor's office in Fulton. Well, I was going to ask you, why didn't you apply to the prosecutor's office? Because that would seem like a, a natural progression, but you did. I did. <laughs> and how was that? How, how long were you there? So I was there for about a year and a half. In my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, you know what? Fulton County has major caseload. This is something where I can really, really learn the system here down in Georgia. Um, I can learn from ex some exciting, you know, well-known prosecutors and things like that. And then I can figure out what I want to do, if I want to stay here or if I want to go back out on my own. And I decided after about a year and a half, like, no, I don't want to work for anybody. Like, it's, it's a done deal. I'm sorry. I don't. That whole safety, security thing, like, it's just not me. I don't want to work for anybody. So we're going to have to figure it out. So you were like, screw yeah. this. <laughs> screw this. I'm, I'm just going to hang a shingle. <laughs> I mean, after a year and a half, you probably, you got a good sense of what the system was like after that amount of time there. Tell me what you've learned about being a lawyer versus being the business owner and the manager. It's a whole different animal. <laughs> How do you like it? Which one do you like better? Being a lawyer. Yeah. I, the business side of it is too, too, too much in my mind for me. Um, I guess maybe like too overwhelming. So yeah, if I could just do the lawyer thing without working for somebody, but still being a lawyer, I don't know how that would work. That's what I would want to do versus, yeah, owning a business. But I have to say I've grown into understanding how to own a business, how to make my business prosper, how to manage people, how to do it all. You know, Christina, like, yeah, it's, it's a it's lot. <laughs> It's um, you're wearing a lot of hats and you're not necessarily going to be good at all of those roles and you're not necessarily going to like all of those roles. So, but I know how to manage. They'll tell you, well, you know, you, you can pick the one 
that you like. So if you like practicing law, you could have a vision for your firm where you are the one practicing and you have other people that are doing a lot of the admin. Mm -hmm. So is that something you've been trying to do? Is that a goal you have? What, what's your vision for the future? <laughs> that is a loaded question. Let me tell you. <laughs> I love loaded um, questions. That's usually good material for the podcast. In, in my mind, I have like a three to five year exit plan. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to build this massive firm to where I'm managing associates and I have all this team and things like that. So we're just figuring out how that's going to transition. But ultimately, I want to do more of, like I said, more of training. You know, I want to get involved again with, like I said, the police department and things like that. Um, I have a podcast starting where we're going to, you know, talk about all things policing. Um, it's called Black State Blue Nation. And I just want to do other things. Other things, though, that I can take my legal knowledge and my police knowledge and put it into another business. Like what kind of business? I haven't really, I'm working on it. That, that's still a, a work in progress. Um, like I said, it would probably involve something with um, like I said, training, you know, in the police department. Um, but I haven't really, we're working yeah. on it. Yeah. Well, why is that important to you? Like, what's the ultimate goal with that? I don't want the, the hustle and bustle of court so much. Um, you know, being a criminal defense attorney, obviously we're in 50 million courts at one time and, you know, things like that. And I don't, you know, I, I'm ready to, kind of retire without retiring. If you understand what I'm saying. You know no, what I'm saying? I get it. I totally get it. Well, I can definitely relate to something that you've said is, you know, you didn't want to work for someone else. You want control over your schedule and your life. And when you are doing work where you have to be in court all the time, you really don't have a lot of control over your schedule. So like you're working for someone, you're now you're working for the court. Because you can't exactly. just, you know, say, okay, well, I'm going on vacation this week. Bye. If you have court, although I guess maybe you could now because of Zoom. But I'm sure eventually we're, you know, I'm, COVID can't last forever, right? So eventually we're all going to have to go back to court. Exactly. Uh, but, yeah, I'm hoping. I guess it can't last forever. I, I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I shouldn't say travel, that. I, you know, and I love to travel. So, you know, even now I still, you know, I'm still starting to travel back again. And, um, you know, all we need obviously is our computer and our phone, but yeah, I want more of that. Like I said, I don't want to always do the hustle and bustle. I I'm kind of headed towards the down, you know, end of everything. And I just want freedom. I want to be able to travel. I want to be able to, you know, let's say help my family financially, you know, mom and dad getting older, things like that. And I just want to live my best life for this second half of my life and do things that I didn't even know it was possible because, you know, back then, had I known that we could basically design our lives, you know what I'm saying, on how we want them to be, um, you know, it would be maybe, you know, things would be different. So yeah, I want to well, take advantage of knowing that now for the yeah. future. Well, better late than never, right? I mean, David always says that what, where you've been has brought you to where you are. And then the things you're doing now are going to be what leads you to whatever's next. Absolutely. What do you, what's it like a typical case that you handle at your firm in the criminal law? Who are your clients? What kind of cases are you doing like murder trials or are you doing? No murders. We don't really, I mean, we could obviously in co-counsel with them and stuff like that. I don't want that I think massive case. I handle more of the, you know, aggravated assaults, the, you know, gun charges, drug charges, theft cases, things like that. Usually my clients are, they're black males who have a family, you know what I'm saying? So they have, you know, a wife and kids or kids or a wife. And for whatever reason, they're put in this situation and you know, they're in fear of losing everything that they have, losing their job, losing their family um, and things like that. So those are, are pretty much my clients on the, on the criminal, criminal defense end. 
Well, you do immigration too, which is actually really important because there can be immigration implications a lot of times in criminal law. So on, on more of a macro level, like what are things that you see in the criminal justice system now that are weaknesses? Like what are things that you, in your opinion, we need to focus on as a society? I feel like it's still treating people equal. I know that sounds, you know, maybe cliche, oh, we're all not equal, but at the end of the day, we all are, we're all just humans. And so, you know, I think sentencing across the board and stuff like that should all be the same. I think there shouldn't be what color you are, basically, you know what I'm saying, is going to determine how you get treated in the system. And is that what's happening now? Because I don't practice criminal law. So I only know these issues from what I might see on the news. There's, yeah, there's still always disparity. And I don't know if it'll ever go away. You know, obviously we were hoping that, you know, with times progressing and things like that, that there would be, but black people get treated differently. Brown people get treated differently. That's just the way of the world. And then, you know, obviously where we, you know, just came from with, you know, administration and things like that, it's, it's at the forefront. So. Well, do you see an effort to bring attention to those things? Do you see an effort for the people that are in the criminal justice system enforcing all these rules to, to be mindful of it, you know, to recognize this problem and to do something about it? Or do you think it's just talk? Because I'd really like to know. No, I, you know, I really do think there are people that are really working for, you know, criminal reform and things like that, that it is a, a an effort that's at the forefront, yes, to definitely fix a system that's been, you know, broken for many, many years. When, what was it like to be a criminal attorney when George Floyd happened? And I don't want to really use that in the past tense because... It just happened. But when you were really in the thick of it, what was it like? So obviously we've had a lot going on over the past year, two years. And for me though, I could always, and I'm not saying anything, and I have to preface this to say, I'm not saying police were justified. I'm not saying any of that stuff. But what I'm saying is I can see both sides of the situation and why certain things happened, you know, to get to where we are, because a lot of people don't know what the police mind, what they're thinking at the time that certain situations are happening. I do. So I can see both sides of it. And there's definitely obviously room to fix a lot of issues, you know, that are going on. But at the end of the day, the news and everything kind of, you know, escalates and highlights all of, you know, the bad per se, but they don't know the mind of, of the police officer and what's going on at the time. Yeah. Do you think that the use of body cams has helped from, from where you sit? I do. Um, and because it even back, because back we didn't have body cams back in the day, you know, so I, I really do think that they um, they help the situation from obviously a standpoint of the public and the citizens being able to, let's say, maybe get justification or, or justice if something goes wrong. But I don't know if they really help the police officer make a different decision. Yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. And you know, I try to, I try to respect the, the position of being a police officer and being in a dangerous situation where I can only imagine you're, you're scared. Um, you know, you're trying to make a split second decision about what to do. Um, but at the same time, you know, being respectful of, of the community and, and the people that you're encountering and not making a decision that really is going to affect someone else's life forever, like, you know, killing someone or hurting someone. Um, it's been suggested to me that it's largely a training issue. So it's interesting to me that you said that you wanted to get involved in training. 
So I would want to hear more about that. And is, is that one of the reasons? I mean, do you want to get more involved in, in sort of fixing the system with training? It, you have to start somewhere. So yes, because I think they have to be aware. So police have to be aware of, you know, the breakdown in the system and the things that they could work on. Like I said, it's not just a police issue because still it's a citizen issue as well. A lot of times we'll talk about, well, the the, the citizen was uh, resisting. The police had to use a little bit more force to get them handcuffed. But what people don't understand is that your natural reaction when somebody is going to handcuff you is to tense up because that's just a natural reaction. So I think all of that needs to be, and I think that's part of training. So all of that needs to be incorporated in some sort of education, you know, to both the citizens and the police so that we can all work together and make sure that we don't have any more, you know, people dying unnecessarily. And and I don't want to put it all on you like you're supposed to figure out in, you know, the next few minutes how we are going to handle the issue of racism and police brutality and all of that. Um, but I am I really am happy to hear your opinions about it because you are a woman of color and you've also um, been a police officer and been working in the criminal justice system as an attorney. So I think you actually have a really unique perspective and I'm interested in hearing that. So what are some other things that you hope to achieve? May, we'll talk about a lighter subject in your personal life. I'm not, not fixing the world. You know, you're going to do that. I know it. But what do you want to do in your personal life? Wow. Really? <laughs> we don't have to talk about that if you don't want to. I'm, well, no, I'm, I'm just messing with you. So actually, I, I want to get married again. I'm not going to have any kids um, at this point in my life, but I would like a, a partner and uh, just be able to, um, like I said, continue to travel uh, continue to grow my practice and figure out the next steps of my life and do it from a place of, um, peace and, you know, and happiness and, and things like that. Will you continue the law firm? Will it, will you just hire people to kind of keep it running on autopilot while you go off and do these other things? Maybe initially, you know, for, for maybe a hot minute. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, no, maybe we can just sell it and move on. <laughs> well, I mean, what do you, like, what if you figured out about your purpose? Because you went from police work and then went to law school and started your firm, you're doing criminal work. I mean, all those things are in some way preparing you, right? I mean, I always feel that way about everybody's life, my own life, your life. It's like all these things, you know, happen for a reason. They're preparing you for something. They're leading you to the next thing. And you don't necessarily realize it at the time, but right. looking back, you do. What do you feel like is, or maybe you haven't figured it out yet, like your life's purpose? To help fix the system. To figure out how to bring quality and justice to African Americans, immigrants, just to, to, to be that person that, I don't know, helps to fix a broken system. I, that's, that's how I feel. And however I can do that, whether it be, you know, keeping a father out of prison or keeping, you know, a, a young Hispanic male from being deported. And then, figuring out how to just bring just everything back together with the police and the citizens and having that mutual respect. I don't know. That's, that's just what I want to do. And I know it sounds so like foo-foo, but it's like, I, I feel like, like I said, we're, we're all humans and we need to all be treated like that. And like, can we all just get along? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think it sounds foo-foo at all. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about it too. And I, something that has occurred to me is 
you know, it doesn't start like where we're talking about it now. It, it doesn't start when someone gets arrested or when, you know, even before that, when someone feels the need to do something to break the law in the first place. I mean, I think it really starts when, when we're kids and what are we being taught? You know, what are, what are people talking about at home? And I think a lot of those racist views you learn, you definitely learn them. I mean, nobody is born being racist. I don't, I don't believe that. Uh, you learn that from your environment and I have no idea how we fix that. So if you have any ideas, you let me know. Yeah. That one I'm not going to touch, <laughs> but like, yeah. it, it starts, it starts at home because it is something that's learned. I always love that you know, like on Facebook, you see those those posts with the, the little black boy and the little white boy, and they just go and embrace each other when they see each other. They don't know that one is any different than the other. And yes, so it's yes. Like, it's true. I love that one with the, the little black boy and the little white boy and they're, they think they're twins. Yes. They dress up in the same outfit and they they really don't see any difference. They don't. And what a beautiful world it would be if everybody was like that. So many problems would just go away. It would. It, it would. It yeah. would be so nice. It would be amazing. But, you know. Your purpose would be achieved. You'd be done. You'd have to go find something else. Right. Check. Did that. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this, um, because I'm sure people want to know is how did you end up having your niche be men, men, the men's law firm? Well, it goes back to, like I said, the disparity in the system with, you know, black males being treated differently. Okay. Clearly sentencing guidelines, everything just different. And so long story short, <laughs> I had a conversation one day with somebody and we were talking about my dad and my dad has been in my life all my life. Um, my parents were divorced when I was younger, but he's been around. Okay. So he wasn't an absentee father or anything like that. Was never in jail or anything like that. But I was trying to figure out just kind of like certain things that we did together, you know, as, as a child, you know, that I can remember. And remember, I told you, like, I, I forget a lot. Like, I haven't remembered a lot of stuff other than that one incident. And I couldn't remember exactly some monumental moments and things like that. And so in my head, I was thinking, if I can't remember that as a child with my father still being in my life, you know, although, you know, divorced parents, what happens to these children where their fathers are gone to prison and taken away? Or what happens to these children where their fathers are deported and they're not able to see them or talk to them or anything like that? How does that affect them? And somehow that's just why like, okay, well, you know what? That's how I can make a difference. You know, I can make sure that, you know, a father still is able to, you know, see his kids and the kids can remember the dad. And even though he got that DUI or, you know, he, you know, he had that gun possession charge or gun charge. So. Well, that's interesting. Is that anywhere in the sentencing guidelines? If they even have that anymore? Cause like I said, I don't do criminal law, but there are sentencing guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. Does it ever come into play whether someone has family responsibilities, if they have kids that are dependent on them? So the only time that that is taken into consideration a little bit is in immigration court when we're, um, let's say, if we have a cancellation of removal case and, and attempting to make sure that someone doesn't get deported, then, you know, we can give reasons on why they should not be deported. And of course they can, they'll take into consideration, you know, family ties, um, you know, United States citizen kids, wife, and any sort of issues or anything like that with, with family structure. But as far as just criminal cases and sentencing and things like that, no, I mean, you could be a business owner, you know, paying your taxes and giving to the community, you know, you get caught with drugs, you get caught, you know, with, with a gun, whatever it might be. And the law is the law. I mean, prison is meant to punish people, right? Or, and, or remove them from society because they're a danger. Prison is uh, meant to rehabilitate people. It is? 
<laughs> well, how are they doing that? <laughs> I mean, is that really what, because that wasn't my perception. Is that really what, what people in the criminal justice system talk about is that prison is for, to rehabilitate? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, it's punishment for your crime, but it technically is supposed to rehabilitate people so that when they come back out, allegedly they've learned from what they've done and that they won't do it again. But the system like put like time out. Not exactly. Right. Put them in the corner. Like, <laughs> time out. You get a time out. It's 10 years, but you get a time out. <laughs> what are they doing to rehabilitate them? I mean, do they get therapy? Do they get you're like laughing at me as I'm saying this. They get therapy or job training or education or anything like that when they're in there. That means that that is available, but that's where we go back to the system being being broken, and it it is more on the punishment side than the rehabilitative side. Because, like for instance, even let's not even talk about prison. Okay, let's talk about probation. Okay, so. I always argue in court, no matter what, you cannot give my client 10 years probation because that's setting them up for failure. Do you think in a 10 year time frame that they won't one day drive without a license, hypothetically, or do something very, very minor? And now they violated their probation. Now they're back in court on a violation of probation. They can possibly go to prison now because they violated their probation. 10 years is setting them up for failure. Why would you even do that to a person? You know what I'm saying? Like if you really want them to learn from their, their mistakes and, and also punish them, you know, per se, five years, whatever, give them this shorter period of time to show them that they've had this restriction in their life, that they can only do X, Y, and Z, and they can't, you know, go out of that box and then let them move on with their life. But 10 years, I mean, heck, I don't know if I can be good for 10 years. I can't be good for 10 minutes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I get what you mean. It's setting them up for failure. That's just probation. <laughs> does that argument work sometimes? It does. Oh, good. Good. So I like to end each interview with a couple of questions that I call a Proust questionnaire. Have you ever done a Proust questionnaire? I have not. So it's basically supposed to be designed to ask you a series of questions that are really short answers, but reveal something about your character. Okay. <laughs> you look scared. <laughs> Don't be scared. Okay. Well, so we'll just do a few. Okay. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Ooh. Perfect happiness would be waking up every day to the sun, to water, family, and just being peaceful within myself. Do you feel like you're not peaceful with yourself right now? I've learned and I'm, I'm there. Like I'm, I'm really seeing where I'm getting there to where I enjoy being me. You know what I'm saying? Like I accept me for all of my differences, for all of my experiences, good and bad. And yeah. So now I can actually say yes. Years and years and years ago, no. But now, absolutely. I think that is a good feeling. And I totally know what you mean by that. Just feeling at peace. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to get to be 46 or 50 to get there. There you go. <laughs> What is your greatest fear? Ooh, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My, my, it used to be my greatest, it used to be my greatest fear was failure, not succeeding. You know, I always joke about not making enough income and, and sleeping under a bridge. We all know that that won't happen. You know what I'm saying? Because you have family to back you up. But I think that used to be my greatest fear. I don't know right now if you ask me what my greatest fear is. I don't know. People used to, people always talk about like leaving a legacy and things like that. And I always thought that it was, you had to have kids to leave yeah. a legacy. You know what I'm saying? And things like that. So 
Um, and I don't have kids. And so I'm like, well, then I can't leave a legacy because I don't have kids. But I'm understanding that, no, you can. And it's for other women, other Black women. It's for other people's children. Um, it's for the world and things like that. So I guess maybe my greatest fear would be that to not realize that I am actually going to leave a legacy when I, when I move to, on. To just die and disappear. Yeah. Just be gone. Nothing's left behind. <laughs> poof. <laughs> yes. Poof. I was just thinking that poof. I think you're right though, because I don't have children. I'm 46. I'm not having them. And I think we've talked about this before. People will be like, Oh, but you could, you know, it's like, they're trying to console me and I'm like, no, we're good. I'm, we're I'm good. good. I'm really good. <laughs> like no need to console me, but you're right. It's like, we're programmed to believe that our children will be our legacy, but I don't, I don't believe that because let's face it. You could have a kid that's a complete and total screw up and you don't want that to be your legacy, right? That's not your legacy. When I, I believe your legacy is, is really, it's what you teach people while you're here and what you do for them while you hear you're here and yes. pass that on. And, and you're I doing a great job. Oh, thank you. You are too. You're fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So which historical figure do you most identify with? Figure. Maybe these questions aren't fair because I don't even know how I would answer that. <laughs> yeah, I don't, never even thought about it. No. Maybe, uh, maybe this is an easier one. <laughs> which living person do you most admire? I would say, well, okay, I guess that'd be a couple. I would say um, one would be my mom as for like somebody that I can feel and touch. <laughs> and then two is like Oprah Winfrey. I don't know. I've always admired Oprah Winfrey. She's a phenomenal black woman. She's She's done so much to, you know, move up, you know, in the ranks and just, you know, pave a way. Probably. Yeah, she's had an incredible life and mm -hmm. achieved so much. She's yeah. incredibly smart. I love her. I would love to interview Oprah. So if anybody knows her, <laughs> hook me up. Hey, put it, manifest it. Put it out there. Manifest it. That is right. Okay. What trait do you most deplore in yourself? And then what trait do you most deplore in other people too? I don't like when people, I don't like know-it-alls. I don't like people that think that they know everything about every possible thing in the whole entire world. Yeah, they're annoying. <laughs> that is annoying because they don't. Hate to break it to you. <laughs> um, and then myself, I deplore nothing about myself, Christina. Hey, well, aren't you being a know-it-all? <laughs> You know what? I, I I guess I wouldn't say deplore, but I hate feeling like I should care about what everybody else thinks about me. Yeah, that's a good one. No. It's very <laughs> freeing not to care. Because sometimes, look, I think we all care to some degree, but I will find myself caring too much and I'll recognize it and I'll just be like, good Lord, this is exhausting. Like, I'm done. I don't give a shit what anybody thinks. Exactly. And you immediately feel relieved. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and then I don't know about you, but I will look back on my life and think like, how many things did I do because I just was trying to please someone else? And we can make lists. Oh. Long list. <laughs> yes. Well, you know what though? It's, it's all part of learning. And I, I posted something today on Instagram and said, um, and I didn't make this up. I got it from someone else. Stop shooting yourself. <laughs> so like I should do this and I should do that. And I should be this and I should have done that. And I mean, that's all exhausting. Right. And so looking back on whoever I pleased and didn't do things the way I wanted to, like, just let it go. It's done. I agree. All right. So one more question. I have to make, make it a good one because I have a whole list of them, but <laughs> I'm not going to make you go through all of them. So if you were to come back as a person or thing, what do you think it would be? My dog, Max. <laughs> Yeah, the, they have a pretty good life, don't they? My dog has a fabulous life. But they don't 
haven't lived that long. That's the only problem. Well, he's little. So, you know, give or take, you know, 15, 16, something like that. <laughs> yeah. They have it pretty easy. They don't have to work. They, they just lay around all day. Someone feeds them. Mm-hmm. They He probably gets pet a lot and yeah. hugs. And they're kind of dumb. So they don't, they're not aware of much. Exactly. So, good answer. You're feeding them and you're petting them. They're fine. <laughs> but they don't get to eat good food and go out, right? They can have to eat dog food. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. I hope you did too. And there's so many other things I could ask you, but we'd have to do like another 90 minutes. So maybe another time. Oh, Lord. <laughs> No, I, I really enjoyed this also. And, and I thank you so much for reaching out and us connecting. And it's just amazing how, you know, obviously people get connected. So it's true. And I think we, we all come into each other's lives for a reason. And mm-hmm. I really believe that. So thank you. You have, you have an interesting story and I hope that you will take some time and reflect on our conversation and give yourself credit for really being truly a ballsy woman. Oh, thank you. You are. You're an inspiration. And I know that you're going to do good things. I can't wait to see what good things you do because I know you haven't quite figured out where your path is going to go, but I, it's going to be something good. And I'm looking forward to seeing what that is. Thanks, Christina. I'm, I'm excited too. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Well, we'll have to catch up sometime. Let's stay in touch. In the meantime, can you let everybody know how they could best reach out to you if they're interested in talking to you more or retaining your services? Absolutely. So the name of my firm is Legron Law. Uh, we are a criminal defense and immigration firm. And you can reach us at 678-250-5449. And our website is legronlaw.com. And I will have links to everything on the show notes. So you can refer to those as well. Thank you again, Mel. Thanks, Christina.